thought. Greatness is attained only by the thinking of great thoughts. No man can become great in outward personality until he is great internally, and no man can be great internally until he thinks. No amount of education, reading, or study can make you great without thought, but thought can make you great with very little study. There are altogether too many people who are trying to make something of themselves by reading books without thinking. All such will fail. You are not mentally developed by what you read, but by what you think about what you read. Thinking is the hardest and most exhausting of all labor, and hence many people shrink from it. God has so formed us that we are continuously impelled to thought. We must either think or engage in some activity to escape thought. The headlong, continuous chase for pleasure in which most people spend all their leisure time is only an effort to escape thought. If they are alone, or if they have nothing amusing to take their attention, as a novel to read or a show to see, they must think, and to escape from thinking, they resort to novels, shows, and all the endless devices of the purveyors of amusement. Most people spend the greater part of their leisure time running away from thought. Hence, they are where they are. We never move forward until we begin to think. Read less and think more. Read about great things and think about great questions and issues. We have, at the present time, few really great figures in the political life of our country. Our politicians are a petty lot. There is no Lincoln, no Webster, no Clay, Calhoun, or Jackson. Why? because our present statesmen deal only with sordid and petty issues, questions of dollars and cents, of expediency and party success, of material prosperity without regard to ethical right. Thinking along these lines does not call forth great souls. The statesmen of Lincoln's time and previous times dealt with questions of eternal truth, of human rights and justice. Men thought upon great themes. They thought great thoughts, and they became great men. Thinking, not mere knowledge or information, makes personality. Thinking is growth. You cannot think without growing. Every thought engenders another thought. Write one idea, and others will follow, until you have written a page. You cannot fathom your own mind. It has neither bottom nor boundaries. Your first thoughts may be crude, but as you go on thinking, you will use more and more of yourself. You will quicken new brain cells into activity, and you will develop new faculties. Heredity, environment, circumstances, all things must give way before you if you practice sustained and continuous thought. But, on the other hand, if you neglect to think for yourself and only use other people's thoughts, you will never know what you are capable of, and you will end by being incapable of anything. There can be no real greatness without original thought. All that a man does outwardly is the expression and completion of his inward thinking. No action is possible without thought, and no great action is possible until a great thought has preceded it. Action is the second form of thought and personality is the materialization of thought. Environment is the result of thought. Things group themselves or arrange themselves around you according to your thought. There is, as Emerson says, some central idea or conception of yourself by which all the facts of your life are arranged and classified. Change this central idea and you change the arrangement or classification of all the facts and circumstances of your life. You are what you are because you think as you do. You are where you are because you think as you do. You see then the immense importance of thinking about the great essentials set forth in the preceding chapters. You must not accept them in any superficial way. You must think about them until they are a part of your central idea. Go back to the matter of the point of view and consider, in all its bearings, 
the tremendous thought that you live in a perfect world among perfect people, and that nothing can possibly be wrong with you but your own personal attitude. Think about all this until you fully realize all that it means to you. Consider that this is God's world, and that it is the best of all possible worlds, that He has brought it thus far toward completion by the processes of organic, social, and industrial evolution, and that it is going on to greater completeness and harmony. Consider that there is one great, perfect, intelligent principle of life and power, causing all the changing phenomena of the cosmos. Think about all this until you see that it is true, and until you comprehend how you should live and act as a citizen of such a perfect whole. Next, think of the wonderful truth that this great intelligence is in you. It is your own intelligence. It is an inner light impelling you toward the right thing and the best thing, the greatest act and the highest happiness. It is a principle of power in you, giving you all the ability and genius there is. It will infallibly guide you to the best if you will submit to it and walk in the light. Consider what is meant by your consecration of yourself when you say, I will obey my soul. This is a sentence of tremendous meaning. It must revolutionize the attitude and behavior of the average person. Then, think of your identification with this great supreme, that all its knowledge is yours and all its wisdom is yours for the asking. You are a god if you think like a god. If you think like a god, you cannot fail to act like a god. Divine thoughts will surely externalize themselves in a divine life. Thoughts of power will end in a life of power. Great thoughts will manifest in a great personality. Think well of all this, and then you are ready to act. End of chapter 13